thank you everyone for uh, spending the time this evening listening to me. Um, uh, and thank you CFA Society, I think this is a lovely uh, event and I had no expectation actually that Bangladeshi Society was like so uh, developed. Um, I passed my CFA actually in 2011 and then I got my charter this January. So there was a long like eight years gap between uh, passing level three and getting a charter because uh, I was quite involved in uh, startups. <laughs> so, um, so uh, I spent uh, pretty much, uh, so when I graduated in 2008, my dream was to become uh, a trader. And I interviewed with Lehman Brothers in 2008, a few weeks before they went bust. Um, and obviously there were no trading jobs back then. So um, I actually joined a startup just to see how it is. And I thought it would be a six month stint before I moved to Middle East to work for some sovereign wealth fund. And here I am after more than a decade, <laughs> still doing startups. Um, so um, I want to actually take a very top down view um, of, of, of startup valuation. People think that you know, a lot of startup valuation is kind of an art, but I think there is actually more science to it um, than, than, you, than you think there is. So I have a little slide um, for those of you who are sitting in the back and can't see the slides. Uh, I urge you to make move for, forward. Uh, so, startup valuation. So, let's start with what we all know. Uh, companies are essentially machines for generating cash, right? There are seasonal fluctuations, but ultimately all companies are essentially uh, bonds. And every company must be valued at like some multiple of their um, cash flows. This is a universal fact, and it doesn't change uh, if you're valuing startups or not. So I start with two companies, uh, Walmart and Amazon. Walmart has a revenue of $515 billion. Amazon has a revenue of $233 billion. The market cap of Walmart as of today is $287 billion. The market cap of Amazon is $883 billion. So if you assume that the um, unit economics of Walmart and Amazon is pretty much the same, right? Like it costs the same to deliver the products. In fact, Amazon probably costs a bit more because you're delivering to your home. Like your logic would say that you know they should have a similar price to revenue. Whereas here, the price to revenue is sort of 7x uh, for Amazon than it is for uh, like Walmart is 0.56, for Amazon it's 3.6. Uh, Walmart was founded in 1962, Amazon was founded in 1994. Why is that important? Because growth, as we all know, is important for any cash flow stream. So why Amazon is pricier, seven times pricier? Number one, I think uh, people often make the mistake of looking at historical growth and assuming that that will be the future, right? It's not really the historical growth that matters. I think what matters is the growth potential of Amazon. Um, and the other thing that matters is the ability to deploy new capital, right? And obviously the size of market that they are tackling. By essentially delivering to people's homes, they have, like there's a Walmart in every seven kilometers with, uh, of a US resident, uh, or 90% of US residents live within seven kilometers of a Walmart, but 100% of US residents live within uh, the purview of uh, Amazon's deliveries, right? So the size of market is probably slightly bigger. And one thing to realize is that you know, revenue can't be really created. Uh, revenue has to be earned from someone else. By earning more revenue, you're probably taking it away from some other factors in the economy. Um, so the first thing here is that for any startup, so this is Walmart versus Amazon, um, the only thing that really matters is the growth potential because the starting revenues for any startup is zero. So valuation of a startup, right? So given the same, so I, I think it comes down to two components. One of them is the story, another is the number. Given the same story, two startups, uh, one with a higher number will have a higher valuation. That's very you know, uh, basic. I think the, the student, since the numbers are minuscule, I mean, the difference between a startup valuation and a public market valuation is in public market valuation, you're essentially valuing commodities, like chaler vendor. And for startup, you're valuing diamonds. You have to look at it. You have to understand its characteristics. You have to understand its flaws, and sort of, um, you know, put a value. The story is the main part of the startup's valuation. The next thing I want to say is, what is, what are the components of the story, right? 
what are the components of a startup story? What makes a great startup story? Number one is um, size of market, right? So if, if you're starting a startup in Bangladesh versus you're starting a startup in India, you have 8x the size of market, so you know it's better to probably start a mark, uh, in, uh, startup in India. But then comes another factor, which is uh, defensibility. I think the defensibility factor is probably the most um, underrated factor in any startup. Like you can get revenues very, very fast, but it's if you get revenues very, very fast, it's probably easy for someone else to uh, replicate your path. And most of the successful startups have one thing, which is um, network effects, right? So if you have one Facebook user, uh, you know, the value of Facebook is not very high. If you have 1,000, you have some value within Harvard. If you have a billion Facebook users, then, you know, you see the network effects. Same with telephone. First telephone had no value, but once uh, billions of people started having telephone, the value of having the telephone has increased. The second thing is obviously economies of scale because as you grow a business, as you grow a business, you end up having lower and lower costs. So as a new person starting that business, it becomes very hard to replicate that business. And I say that, I mean, I think Chandler is a great example of that. When we started in 2013, red light delivery is missing, people forgave us. But today, if someone starts a startup in Bangladesh which delivers groceries, the standard they have to live up to is child out because we do deliveries in one hour. We have 99.9% uh, 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 fulfillment rate. Uh, we do some late deliveries, we're fixing that. But you know, we do most of our deliveries in one hour. So any startup coming in has to live up to that standard. And I think that is what makes our business a little bit more defensible than say starting a barbershop. Um, the third thing about a startup is scalability and speed. Because ultimately we know return on capital is about time. Right? So how quickly you can scale a startup is, is something that matters. So scal scalability is a double-edged sword because if you can scale a startup fast, someone else can also scale it fast. And if, you, uh, I mean, if it's a difficult startup to build, you know, it's difficult for someone else as well. Right? So scalability and speed is slightly, I'd say, inversely correlated with defensibility. Um, so basically, uh, so um, okay, so those two should not be uh, points under scalability and, uh, and speed, it should be uh, different um, points, right? So components of the story is actually um, right sort of founders, right? So it's easier, it's easier for, um, for a young person to start a startup than an older person, this is fact of life. You have kids, you don't have time, you can't focus more, right? Um, your risk of your mortality rate goes up. That's what the insurance charge tells us as you are older. So if you're investing on a startup, you want to invest on the knowledge base of the of the person starting the startup. And the, their knowledge base will grow exponentially. So you want the maximum life for the founder. So younger founder, um, the better. Obviously, that too, like the caveat is younger founders have less experience. But you know, if you look at like say Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, you know they started pretty young, right? And the sort of exponential knowledge benefits came in, uh, and it kicked in, and you know they just built really massive uh, businesses. And I think, uh, and the final component of the story, I think, is the is the is the drive of the founders. So this is something I think is kind of hard to um, measure, but you know you, there are indications, right? If you have passed CFA level three, surely you have a little more drive than someone who has just done his SSC and stopped it. So it is possible to identify drive. I think it is possible to also understand defensibility, size of market, scalability, and speed if you just think about it. Like, you know, if you're deploying a software for ride sharing, you know, it's very easy to just give a software. But if you're business building a business for like, I don't know, steel manufacturing or like ship manufacturing, there's probably a lot more components to it. So, you know, you can actually get uh, really scientific about the story as well. Um, so the key lesson here, I think, is young founders equal to higher value. Um, okay. So next is VC thinking, right? So I've dealt with a lot of VCs in, in in my life, and one of the challenges that I think I faced is is that you know we were starting in Bangladesh, and Bangladesh always seemed like this country which was always flooded, right? And VCs don't want to get into a business that just returns a hundred million dollars uh, because you know we see we, because History, history shows that most of these returns are concentrated on one or two companies. The person who invested in Google, he could have made 10,000 other mistakes, right? So if he lived, like, say, for 10 years, um, and he could have made 30 mistakes a day, right? And, and still come out ahead if he invested in Google. 
um, like he made 30 bad investments a day and still come out ahead. So that is important. Like the like the magnitude of this return, like you know, dispersion is something that I think us like humans are not capable of really realizing. Right. So you are allowed to make a lot of mistakes as a VC. What matters is that if you miss the good startup that you'll never get somewhere. So all the famous VC, they have probably made one or two good investments and that jumped their career, which allowed them to attract more capital, which allowed them to make more mistakes. So it's very like, you know, it's pretty much uh, a, a set game, right? Like you get one right and then you, you're likely to get more and more right. So it is very expensive to miss a successful startup. Nobody remembers failures. Nobody remembers that, you know, Mark Anderson invested in XYZ startup. Right? They, they, they remember that they, they probably invested in Airbnb or Facebook. Um, uh, even Peter Thiel, very bad, um, you know, one of the most successful uh, investors of our time. Uh, he made early investment of, I think, $100,000 in Facebook. And then he has lost billions of dollars in long-term, like, macro bets. Uh, but nobody remembers that. Everyone remembers that Peter Thiel sits on Facebook's board. Um, I think the VC value add, so a lot of VCs come in and think that they can add a lot of value to a startup. But you know, if you really pick the right startup, the VC value add is very negligible. And I'll tell you why. It's because the scale of startup keeps on increasing so fast that the VC is not scaling fast enough, right? So the VC is probably useful for a few months. The VC value add happens in the downside. The VC value add happens when like, there's things are collapsing and you need to bring efforts. But for a successful startup, the VC value add is almost negligible. It's really just the money. Like, you know, you give the money to the right people and you sleep. Thiel's Law. So, this is basically um, uh, like from Peter Thiel, uh, again, like one of the great thinkers of our time. A startup broken in its foundation uh, cannot succeed. I think, like, you know, if you're going to build a billion dollar business, it's important what you do on day one, right? So, I'll give you a few examples from my life. Um, we did not incorporate the company in Bangladesh, we incorporated the company in the US. Uh, we incorporated the company in the US because Bangladesh does not have the legal system to support um, a startup funding, right? We don't understand convertible debts, we don't understand like, our legal, and investors are not very comfortable. The US uh, legal system is uh, a better operating system for startups, like, right? So, you know, I think of it like Windows versus, I don't know, Linux or something like that. Uh, the U.S. system is just so much better that you know you'd be able to attract more capital. So I think it, it's true even today because the ecosystem has not evolved to support startup funding. I think for Bangladeshi startups, it probably makes sense to incorporate in U.S. or Singapore if they're going to attract a lot of money. Um, the second important question I think is market selection. So the story from Chaldal is that when we were starting a business, we uh, we were thinking what is it, so our background is in tech, so we were thinking what is the biggest thing in tech we can do in Bangladesh. And back then you had Alibaba and Flipkart um, and these companies, right, in India and China. And that's, the like, e-commerce is really the biggest thing. But then you study the financials of, uh, like say Flipkart, and you realize that they've spent a billion dollars on just subsidizing cell phones. 10,000 rupees cell phones selling for 9,950 or 9,500, right? So it requires a lot of capital to get uh, a thing like Flipkart running, and what we realized that Bangladesh ecosystem was not ready for it, right? Uh, the other thing about Flipkart was that there was not repeat usage. So you buy a cell phone, and then you don't have any loyalty to the brand. Snapdeal comes next day, offers a lower price cell phone. You go there. So we chose grocery. We chose grocery because uh, we thought the repeat usage would be high, and we were right. Like uh, on our platform, on average, people shop two times a month. Right? On any other platform, e-commerce platform, people really don't shop that often. And the other thing was that, uh, so since we did not have the capital to build a flip card, we were like, let's find a business with repeat usage uh, so that we need less capital. Uh, so that market selection, I think, is uh, fundamental uh, in the early stages. A lot of startups go through uh, changes, but if you look at the really successful ones, uh, very few of them actually uh, go through changes from their uh, original model. Like Amazon just evolved out of a bookstore, or Facebook was a social network from day one, or even Microsoft you know, sold an operating system to uh, IBM, right? So the most successful ones don't really spend time on making mistakes. Uh, I think the other uh, 
like foundational factor is the bond among the founders. Um, for us, I am uh, good at finance. Uh, I went to Wharton. Um, I did financial software and product management for a while. Um, my two founders, uh, Zia, he ran a garments factory, so he was really good at operations. And my other founder, Tejas, um, he was just really good at technology. He's the sort of guy that you know, Google would hire for 500k any day. Um, and even back then, like, you know, he had off offers. So we had different types of uh, backgrounds, and we bonded very well. A lot of startups don't do as well because there is a friction in the uh, founding team, right? Um, because there is a mismatch of ideas. But for us, the rules are very, very clear, right? I said the strategy for, uh, and financing, they just look at technologies, they look at, they look at operations. Um, like we are experts in our domain or emperors in our domain, in, in our startup. And finally, good investors. From day one, we have been lucky uh, to have excellent investors. Um, to name a few, like we have a few of the successful startup CEOs of US. We have an ex uh, chairman of National Economic Council of uh, in the president, US president, uh, invest in us. We have IFC, we have Y Combinator, we have 500 startups. Um, and to this day, nobody sits on our board except for me and Pages. So we have full control and they have that faith. I think having the right investor with the right mindset um, just reduces so much friction, right? You won't focus on building the business, not dealing with investors. I send out an update once every three months. Sometimes I'll send it out in six months. My investors don't really care. Uh, one thing that we did do is that we took very little money from very moneyed guys. So if someone has a billion dollars to invest, we'll ask them to invest a hundred thousand. Uh, so you know, I, uh, Chalal was one of the smallest deal that IFC has ever done, three million dollars. Like IFC doesn't do deals that small; they have, they have to make an exception, and you know they don't give you pain if you take that kind of money. Um, <coughs> so this is the foundational aspects. The other part of startup is lessons from uh, Jeff Bezos, right? And this comes uh, from a more operational standpoint, right? Um, as a startup, basically everything you spend is an investment, and you have to return that investment. So it is important to, if you're if you're going to keep your ROI high, it makes sense to uh, spend less. Uh, since uh, so Jeff Bezos used to make uh, tables out of uh, used doors. Uh, and you know, if you look at early videos, like uh, even when they were a billion-dollar company, like their office looked like complete shit. Um, and for us, we still buy second-hand laptops. Our laptops we buy for fifteen thousand taka. They last. Um, we we bought second-hand cars because it was cheaper to do that than lease cars. Which uh, not 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 even uh, first-hand cars out of the question. Um, so we were very very careful about like the sort of expenses that we make. And you know, even to this day. Like I was telling someone there, I'm I'm very much a keepta person. <laughs> I mean, I'm a of keepta. It's it's unbelievable. Uh, so I think it's important to keep your expenses low. And the other thing from Bezos is cash flow is more important than earnings. I think Amazon, in its uh, entire life, made made less profit than Walmart makes in like two quarters or something like that. Uh, it, they've always been. A negative earnings company, but positive cash flow. The way they get cash flow is because vendors give them um, working capital, right? So initially, what it started was that they would get the credit card cash flow immediately and then dispatch the book 45 days later, later, and that sort of helped them. So having a positive cash flow, I think, is very important, and this is something I think Jeff Bezos has particularly proven in this world uh, more than anyone else that you know cash flow is key. So the tricky balance as a start startup founder, like um, and um, and as you guys maybe in investors, I think uh, what is important to realize is the best ideas don't always win. Um, like you know, it's DC current versus AC current is the most common story. Um, I'm sure uh, Ford did not make the best cars in the world, um, but they won, right? And I think a lot of the winning comes from a combination of things, which is uh, ability to attract capital. If you attract Capital, you can invest on better talent. That's um, so ability to attract investment for any startup. I think is is super super critical, right? Even if someone has a better idea, if you can attract investment, you can uh, outshine them. What this does is it puts people into a trap, right? Um, since startups are valued, as I said, uh, in terms of multiples of revenue, at one point they used to be valued at like multiples of kicks, right? Because no one had. Uh, no one would make a DCF model, so they would value their multiple revenue. Which you should so now it's valued multiple of revenue. The easy way to 
uh, generate revenue as per Warren Buffett is that if you're going to sell a hundred dollar bill for ninety dollars, you can generate infinite revenue, right? So that's what a lot of startup founders do in this world, and uh, but I think that's a drug because if you're doing that, you have to continue doing that. You do that, you attract investment, you spend investment to keep doing that strategy over and again, over again, till it just becomes a giant Ponzi scheme. Um, so I think uh, you know you have to be, startup founders and especially investors have to be careful about this, right? How, whether the unit economics really makes sense. Yes, obviously there are stories, right, where the unit economics doesn't make sense today, but at scale it makes sense, right? Uh, but you know those stories need to be investigated. So. You know, the philosophies that you hear like over the last 20 years is like, get big fast, too big to fail, go big or go home. I think these are very, very dangerous philosophies, um, especially in a market like Bangladesh where capital is limited. Um, so, yeah, so, that, so, in, so a startup founder has to strike the right balance between how much revenue they want to generate and how, how much investment they want to uh, attract and how they're doing it. So, Taking a step back, um, and I, I said this from the Bangladesh perspective, right? Um, I think uh, in a world where you know AI is taking over most human tasks, um, underutilization of resources, like you know, that's what the country has depended on so so far, right? So we don't really use resources as efficiently. Uh, but if you look at developed countries, the only real way to get economic growth is productivity growth, right? So that's what shifts the um, overall AD car curve, if you, if you will, right? uh, or aggregate supply curve. Um, uh, but utilizing under uh, underutilized resources is a strategy that cannot be scaled. You don't have infinite supply of underutilized resources. Um, so you, know, you need to sort of move into this world where you are allowing ideas to actually use the resources more efficiently. Right? <laughs> Uh, mass production, like garments industry, will always be competitive. I think I heard a stats where there were 2,400 garments factories, and now there are 800. Um, maybe it makes sense as a sector, but um, like if you're investing in the 800 industry, if you're an index, you'll probably end up making money. But uh, I think it's 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 uh, like if you're in competition, you're always putting a lot of resources in fighting each other, and that is resources that doesn't need to be used, right? So uh, avoiding competitive industries. And I think startups allow an outlet to get out of competition and create something new. Um, um, so the reason, and you know, we have a lot of human resources, and I believe um, knowledge basically is going through a space of osmosis where you can look at Wikipedia, YouTube, etc., uh, and and sort of get a lot of knowledge. So our our uh, like you know next generation, um, you know, actually is a lot more knowledgeable. So. I think it is important to now empower them with like sort of investment startup uh, frameworks uh, so that they can get into industry which are not competitive and which can actually add value to the world and can actually add productivity growth in this world. Bangladesh is a great testing ground for startups. Low labor cost is number one because any startup, uh, you know, you don't actually build up the entire system on day one. In day one, you're always hacking things. Right, um, you're you're always using people to fill up software, but the software comes eventually. Uh, so you replace a lot of jobs. So Bangladesh, being a low labor cost, it's easier to start a startup with, which is like a really big startup, uh, but requires a lot of software than it is in San Francisco. Um, so it will you will get a better ROI in Bangladesh. High density means low distribution cost, and then the market is you know has decent economic growth, so you should get a tidal uplift. And the environment is very stable compared to, I think, like Nigeria or Pakistan or somewhere like that. So I think Bangladesh makes a great testing ground, and which is why I think more investments needs to go uh, into, into startup. Uh, one of the stats uh, that I had was the US investment. Um, so I, I forgot the exact, but it was like 2% um, of basically their market capitalization actually goes into venture, venture capital. Like, uh, venture capital. And you know, even if you can get that kind of money going towards venture capital, I'm sure that we could have uh, a lot more startups. <clears throat> so how do we develop this ecosystem? I think the first thing that we need to do as we are evaluating startups, and you know, as financial professionals, like I'm sure a lot of you will encounter startup. I think the first rule is forget valuation, because it's impossible to value just the story. You can use a convertible debt structure 
to prevent like downside risk, uh, but yet get an upside risk. It's important for the founders to have a skin in the game, right? So if you, if so, one of the first conversations that I had about uh, funding Chalda, the investor said, uh, "I what do you want for 51 percent of the company?" And that really annoyed me. And Still annoys me, obviously, uh, because you know if I give away 51% of the company, why am I doing this, right? I'm doing this so that I can work three times as hard. If 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 I could be earning, uh, say, 150k in the US uh, or or in Singapore with low taxes, live in Bangladesh, I want to do a startup because I want to earn more than 150k per year because I want to work maybe five times as hard and I want to work more efficiently. So I want to add maybe two million dollars a year to the to the ecosystem, right? So, uh, so I think asking for fifty one percent from a person like that like, will just simply annoy them. Um, number two, that uh, the common thing that I'm seeing among startups right now is that there is no standard set of documents that people can follow. So I've made some attempts with some lawyers to standardize documents for startup, but you know because the startup founders that we see are. Um, the ecosystem does not have, like in the US you will have standardized documents that you can use every investor trust. In Bangladesh you don't have it. So these things are not getting funded. And for startups, speed is everything, right? Um, speed is everything. So if you're spending all your time doing this documentation, you're not actually adding value in this world. You're just um, like, you know, going around in circles. And I think the third thing, uh, especially for say a company like us, is that uh, we need a more open forex regime so that we can prove ideas outside of Bangladesh. It is not in, it is not good enough that Chalda works in Bangladesh. Chalda needs to work in Thailand too, because that's how global tech companies think, and you know that's how Israeli companies think. And Israeli companies do really well. Israeli companies day one will target U.S. market, right? We can't do that. I think if we really want high return from the startup ecosystem in Bangladesh, we need to have a mechanism in which. Startups in Bangladesh can invest uh, outside of the country. Um, um, so this is the final slide. Um, I mean, if any of you are thinking of uh, being entrepreneurs, which I doubt many of you are, but uh, I think it's important to be decisive because speed is of the essence. Decide, it's the cost of a wrong decision is not high. The cost of not making a decision is pretty high. Uh, reduce the cost of experiments. So one uh, person once told me that running a startup is like throwing darts at a dartboard, but the dart is stuck to a train and you're riding a horse. So, you know, so, so how do you get the best shot? Like, you know, what matters is getting that right idea. You have to maximize the number of darts you throw. And in order to maximize the number of darts you throw, you minimize the cost and you, mini you maximize the speed of throwing, right? So you have more and more people who can actually execute on random experiments uh, in your company. Uh, don't assume funding is guaranteed because Bangladesh is not India, Bangladesh is not the US. Um, we still don't have enough startups to have a funding environment, right? Um, like, just look around you, like there are no VCs. Um, don't stress valuation, valuations will be low, but basically uh, you can use options um, to uh, like, you know, secure your upside. And downside doesn't matter. Startup founders usually are very uh, sunny and uh, confident person. Like, you know, I don't care about downside. Um, if I fail, I fail and go back to a job. But you know, I, I care about the upside. So use options to get the upside and get the valuation point right. Think through the opportunity. I think a lot of people, you know, will just start the first business because they want to like start a startup. I think you know it's important to think about the systematic things that they can affect by being in Bangladesh. Um, I think it's important to do do the right idea or at least a good enough idea rather than jump on the first idea. And finally, play to your strengths. Uh, if you're good at finance, do something on that. I, I think playing to your strengths, obviously, like people don't realize how much uh, how much their um, knowledge is, right, or how much their life experiences are, and they want to go into a complete new field. And I think that's a mistake. They should stick to their strengths. Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, thank you. So, if you have any question, you can raise your hand, and we will. Uh, give you the mic to Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Zubair. Uh, I work in startup as well. So whatever the points in our here, I could like connect with all of those things. Now, uh, you said that you were incorporated in the US, right? Yes. OK, so my question to you is that what are the extra benefits that you get by incorporating in the US? Obviously, you touched a little bit on that. But if you can like elaborate on this. For example, the startups that are incorporated in Bangladesh, what are the things that they are actually missing out? 
So if you can like, you know, for example, when you go to deal with the invest, uh, I mean the you know local, uh, you know the regulatory authorities, what are the benefits that you get right now? We don't get any benefit from the local regulatory authorities, but I know that if you know, like I don't have to go through the Bangladesh legal system if something screws up really badly. And there are good precedences in the U.S. to sort out things like that. If there's a control issue, I know exactly how it will play out. And investors know that too, and that gives them confidence. A lot of the investors that we have taken money from would not have invested money if it was a Bangladeshi company because they don't understand how they will exit out of the country. They don't understand how, um, you know, how, what sort of paperwork they have to do. And they're not never going to come and visit Bangladesh. So your investor base is much bigger. Uh, you have a much better uh, regulatory environment, and finally, like you know, if, if it really becomes successful, like in repatriate dividends and open up in Nigeria, right? Um, which a Bangladesh company can't. So uh, my question is about your experience on fundraising. So you have raised capital at the different stages of the company, right? So did the valuation methods uh, that you both parties uh, use, like you and as well the founder? Uh, evolve or change as you uh, grow larger. Maybe some details on um, on, on the methods uh, that are practically being used. Okay, so mechanics of valuation. <laughs> so in the early stages, valuation is what you can negotiate, right? So you're using convertible debt with a cap, which means that you know, say an investor wants to put in a hundred thousand dollars, and you set a cap of one million. That means they will have ten percent of the company. But you know, if, if in the next round your valuation is five hundred thousand, they will have. 20% of the company. So in the early stages, uh, like you basically negotiate on the cap, and investors don't really care about the downside. So if you get the right investor, they'll be like, oh yeah, that's fine. Uh, so in the early stages, we also had a coupon attached to, to the thing. So they actually got a guaranteed return of 6%, the early guys who invested in uh, convertible debts uh, of Chalda. As we went through the funding rounds, uh, we keep, kept on increasing the cap of things, right? So investors were coming in and saying that, hey, this is the cap, this is the cap. Um, there are obviously lots of techniques that you use, right? If you get a good investor to, to agree, others will follow, and then if you have a good amount of demand, you can increase the valuation. Uh, and in the early stages, it was actually very, very hard to get get meetings. Um, like, I think I've, I think the first 30 or 40 meetings we had, like, you know, no one took the meeting, and then you just randomly walk into it, and someone decides to invest, Twenty-five thousand dollars. So it's important who the who the lead investor is because people people follow the lead investor, um, and then as you as you grow up, uh, what start the questions that start coming is that who is going to uh, govern you in Bangladesh, right? And and then like you know I had meetings with some of the best venture capitals uh, capitalists in the world, and they were like, there's no way we'll come to Bangladesh and um, you know sit on your board. Uh, and you know, if they're put, if they're putting hundred thousand dollars, they don't really care. But if they're putting like twenty million dollars, they actually care about uh, governance. Um, so at that stage, basically, you know, we had to do a price round, and you know, IFC came in, IDLC came in, and the reason, uh, you know, I think they're amazing investors because they settle governance issues for good. Like no other, never again do I have to face governance issues. Um, and in the IDLC round, we actually used. Um, uh, like basically, they used multiples of earnings. Looked at what India, what has happened in India. Their DCA. The due diligence was six months plus. Uh, they 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 actually invested three million dollars. They probably spent like three hundred thousand dollars on diligence. Um, and that's because you know it's IFC with the mandate of doing like sustainability, right? They flew flew down like five six times. We had meetings at their office like for uh, six hours. And then that was IFC, but the round before that, I would have a half an hour meeting and someone would say, here, $50,000. And I raised three and a half million dollars just by having half an hour meetings. And I raised that in a matter of 10 days. Three and a half million dollars, $50,000 checks. I got $2 million and then someone called up and said, hey, you have $2 million, I'm gonna put in one more million. And one more million decision happened on a Skype call, 40 minute Skype call. Um, so these are early stage investors who, who don't really care about this, but when IFC came in, they actually cared a lot about uh, looking at the business, and now I'm having Series B discussions, and they see what are the metrics that IFC has used, and say that okay, this is the right metric, this is the right multiple. Then let's just offer something around that, and that's risk-free, right? Right. So, so it changes. You have to actually have the financial strength. Like you know, if I did not have a finance background, um, it would be difficult to go through the IFC diligence. Um, so yeah, 
I mean, I, I, and then like you know, now at this point, I probably have enough cash to hire experts in the market to um, to do things. Thanks for that. I'll just ask them. Uh, so I, I'll give you one more anecdote, right? So we got IDLC as an investor recently, and I was actually invested in the subsidiary, and it was a very very complicated legal instrument that allowed us to uh, do that, right? And I'm really glad that the counterparty on this side was IDLC because IDLC has a reputation of really having a high legal standard. And then IFC was looking at it from the perspective of foreign investors. So it's a very, very solid legal document. And now whenever I go and tell it to anyone in Bangladesh, no questions asked. Hey, we will invest through this instrument. So it's important to get those foundations made. Got it. Uh, thanks for the detailed answer. On that. Just one more follow-up question, but slightly different. Uh, if you were to invest in early stage companies in Bangladesh, right, um, and um, some of the more established methods abroad, they take like uh, scorecard methods and this and that. Like one of the typical startups that get funded and then benchmark uh, these new ideas against those to decide whether you want to pay a premium on the average valuation or not. Like, because at the early stage. You really have nothing. You just have an idea. Um, but in Bangladesh, we don't have that precedence as well, right? So how would you how would you kind of decide that um, the valuation on, on, on pre-revenue, very early stage companies? So uh, I mean, as I said, convertible debts, right? You protect yourself in the downside. Don't worry about the outside. So it's very hard to say the difference between, like, say, a uh, five foot six person and a five foot seven person. But if you said four foot person and a five foot seven person. It's easy, right? So if you think that the startup, like you know, at least is valued like five crores, just offer two and a half crores. There's no way you can lose, right? I think it's uh, a mistake to put brain power behind the valuation because it changes so much, and it's a very binary outcome. Either you lose all your money or you go into the next round, right? So you know, you have to take that mentality, and you have to. And as I said, that most of the returns is concentrated on few big winners. It's important to make a lot of bets. Probably small, right? If you have, uh, say, 10 crore target to invest, don't invest in 10 companies, invest in 100 companies. Hello there. Uh, my name is Kaido. Uh, so, my question is uh, from an analytical perspective, how do I get a sense of like, how wide the J curve will be for a startup? Um, it's impossible. <laughs> uh, it's impossible to get it. Um, I, I, I mean, most good startup founders will tell you that. Like, there have been um, there there have been stories I've seen like Airbnb chart like first year is like, like this and then year three four five it was like pss, like you know, it just continues right and even the founders sometimes don't have the that idea like most great startup ideas are under understood or undervalued because we don't really appreciate the check card. But they say the, the business has a certain years number of years of track record say five ten seven years. I know you can pin it. You can't pin it down, but there has to be some sense, right? So you need to understand what ha what has changed in the last five years versus what's going to change in the next five years. What has changed that will allow it to have a J curve. It is likely that if business is just growing at like you know 10% a year, it's unlikely that they're going to start growing at 200% a year, uh, all, all, all of a sudden. Who was invited for a wonderful presentation? Have a small question. How do you actually? Uh, compensate your key executives in a uh, cost-conscious way that will keep them motivated for long term engagement? It's a challenge. Um, <coughs> and I have a few of my key executives here, uh, <laughs> uh, actually. Um, so, um, so I think what's important is that a lot of the people that have been with the startup has been there since uh, the very early days. And we get them raw, usually. So, you know, uh, yet after they stay for two, three years, they grow very fast in the system, right? And then I do have a lot of um, pressure. Like, you know, Shopping is trying to poach a lot of my guys. Um, so, at three x the salary. And at that point, you have to actually instill the vision in them. That's the only way to keep them. And then you have to give them a part of the vision, okay? create a stock option plan. Um, I think that's the only way. Like, I think they need to really believe it. It's a matter of culture. Um, but you know, we start low. We start low. I think um, uh, our experiments with getting um, external guys into the people who have come from other country in the company has only worked out in a few cases. You know, in more than 50% of the cases, it doesn't work because they don't have the same culture. 
Um, so yeah, so that's pretty much it. That's the best I can say. I mean, it also varies case by case. Like on a tactical basis, you understand what his problem is, solve it, right? If someone is going through a financial crisis because he has a loan, you know, just give away the loan. I mean, I, I've done things like that. Like very, very, very tactically, like I've solved their issues so that they're in a, a good shape. But uh, the stock option thing, no, so, so the foreign exchange regulation says that if you get compensated in the US, uh, you have to cash it out and bring it back, right? But the stock option is not compensation, right? It's a right to buy something. So we give them stock options in the US company, and which they can sell back to the US company once it gets public, right? So um, it, it works out. From IDLC. So I have basically two questions. The first one is that uh, being a startup in Bangladesh, do you feel that the competition here is very low for uh, what you are doing? I, I don't see any uh, actually headway competitor to your company. And that allows you to you know, uh, uh, practice what you believe in. Because if there were other companies and they were burning cash like hell, uh, so you would have to give up. Yeah. So do you think that uh, being a smaller economy, Bangladesh has allowed you to do that. Um, so, point of, to note, Itrat was actually part of the IFC due diligence phase. So, he's actually seen me from the other side of the table. Um, so, um, uh, yes, I think so. I mean, uh, being having that headspace is important, right? Like focusing on what's important, uh, what's what's what has real value is important. A lot of businesses get into very, very competitive markets where it just goes out of control and it becomes a winner takes all. And obviously, we did choose also a kind of difficult market. Like not only did we choose a difficult economy, we also chose a difficult market. So, you know, it was, I would say, somewhat we expected uh, this sort of situation um, as well. Uh, I have a, uh, another question about valuation. So uh, most of us here, we work in public equity. So our idea of value company is looking at the historical financials and project what's going to happen for the next five years or 10 years. So uh, from your presentation about valuing startup companies, my conclusion is that uh, investing in startups is it's about probability. So you will always want to capture the upsides. If you like the idea, it may click and it may be a billion dollar business. So you just make small bits a lot. So uh, do you think that's the right option? So it, it, it's a real option scheme, right? So at every stage, you're reducing the risk of startup. You know, by getting IFC involved, I reduce the risk of, say, governance, right? Or, say, opening more and more web. So every day, we're reducing our technology risk. The technology is getting, like, more and more things are be becoming uh, feasible, right? Uh, we're reducing our customer service. So. You know, in the early stages, it's probability, but you know, in, by the time it gets to Series B, it becomes much more mathematical. Like it's no longer like 10,000 to one that you'll get one right. It's probably like 10 to one that you will get one right, or five to one even. Like a lot of the Series B companies end up doing really well. So I would have just a last question. Uh, do you see that there is a VC ecosystem developed in Bangladesh for Bangladeshi startups that are listed in Bangladesh? So that will take that approach of the privacy investment, investing in a lot of startups and see them grow. I think, uh, like you know, getting IDLC uh, involved was probably one of the biggest things I've done in my life. <laughs> um, like you know, because like it's important to have these like really solid players at the end of the funnel to signal to the smaller guys that you know there are exit opportunities. And this time we're uh, doing a Series B. We actually have a Bangladeshi lead, right? So it is changing. It is changing for us, um, and I am seeing a lot more, lot more activity at the, at the angel level as well. Um, so I, I definitely think it's changing. Uh, we need a few um, examples, like you know, Estonia as a country changed after Skype happened. Uh, so if we have one or two success cases, I think it will change even faster. And also, like figuring out all the uh, tech mechanical issues, like documentation, etc., etc., that needs to be standardized. And thank you. Hello, hey, I'm, I am Shakil uh, from United Finance. I wanted to have a question regarding the role of investors. Okay. So, you, from your presentation, what 
uh, I understood that investors in startups should have a liberal mind, you know. Uh, just uh, do not look into the business efforts more frequently. Just let the uh, founders work their best way. What, from my, what I understand about uh, and the uh, uh, statistics show that activist group investors actually uh, bring value to the startups. That means the investors who uh, uh, frequently talks with the... Can you give me a few examples? You no, know, I have um, statistics from a source. I do not have any specific right. examples. So, so my understanding of activist, right? So every, every company goes through a life cycle. There's a risk cycle, there's a cash cow stage, and then there's declining stage. And I think activists add the most value in declining stage, right? So if you're going to dismantle a business, it is very unlikely that the person who founded the business is going to dismantle it. So that active investor will actually come in and dismantle a business and you know release value for for for, for stakeholders. For for Chala, I mean investors actually add value in terms of a governance, obviously, right? We have to stick to very high standards. I mean it's not automatic that they, they don't have anyone on our board, right? They, they actually we have to we have to report to them uh, pretty frequently. So we are reporting. So they, it's not like they've taken hands off. They're looking at it. Right, but they're just not making uh, decisions because we're probably making good ones. And obviously, there have been cases where the founders have just messed up things, right? And investors need to think, like, you know, if tomorrow um, I pass away, for example, right? I'm sure that uh, the investors will have a, a big role to play. And having really good investors who can handle that, those sort of situations is important because ultimately it's a set of real options, right? So who deals with those sort of eventualities? Uh, is is important and also signaling right good investors signal other investors to invest uh, so that's that's important as well so following up my question uh, here you have said in your uh, startup there are key person for each activity that means for day one for finance you have another one so in an organization where there is a person who is the key person in particular activity and for some reason he is out of the startup or you know accident might happen. So from this perspective, the risk for the investors, you know, how in those situations, how do you think that the investor should value the startup? I mean, valuation obviously should go down a bit, right? So if something happens to a key person, uh, valuation should go down. But you know, as the companies mature, you have better systems in place, you have better like you know sustainability, like succession planning, etc. You have more systems in place so that the key person is not the person who is determining things, right? If we go for like when I started the startup, there was a day when you know like I had to do everything, like drive a car, do a delivery, push a car, etc. Um, now like if I go into vacation for two months, I don't think anything will happen in Chaldal. I think the processes are in place, right? So you just keep on extending that two months to a lifetime and you have a successful startup. Thank you. So I, I, I do want to retire in five years, by the way. <laughs> Best of luck. Question from Edge Research. Uh, my question is, uh, what are the two or three uh, key aspects you uh, want the uh, young entrepreneur to focus when they are teaching investors? Right. Uh, so, I think one of the big mistakes that entrepreneurs make is um, don't understand the importance of having a snowball. Like snowball starts small, right? So when you're pitching, you're trying to raise like four million dollars or say four crore taka. Don't even tell the investor that you're raising raising four crore taka. Say you're using fifty lakhs because you know that the investor has ten lakh taka checks, right? So once you get to forty lakh, then you say, oh, maybe we'll raise one crore, right? Once you get to like ninety lakhs, say we'll raise two crores. I think that snowballing effect is important and is a tactical thing that people don't um, realize. The other thing that I think um, people don't appreciate is the place and settings, setting of things, right? So you meet an investor, it's not just what you say, but how much they already know about you, right? So having <coughs> investor like back channel, understanding your mentors and what they have said, Understanding the investor psychology and tailoring your pitch to that psychology, I think, is uh, underappreciated. I also think like the presentations um, could be a lot more to the point, right? So a lot of people don't come from finance background, and they spend a lot of time on like history or.
things that don't really matter, right? So the first thing I, I, I have done so far, now I don't do that anymore. Like, since our day one, was like, we put out a traction chart. Uh, first, like, always, traction chart. If you have a chart like this, you get the attention. Then you start talking. Thank you for your presentation. I think uh, in the startup space, uh, newness is the most important thing. Newness. Uh, people never heard of these things or so captivating things. Uh, it must be an option. You can refuse to go mm -hmm. to somewhere else and you have to be captivated so that no one no, can. What is the story then? You share some of your experiences in terms of childhood. Like it has to be new and captivating, yeah. right? So, um, so if I say Chaldal's story, right? So these days, when I say Chaldal's story, I, I talk about um, like you know, you're doing e-commerce in a market, Bangladesh, 91 billion dollar consumer market, 50 billion dollars is groceries. Um, so it makes sense to focus on groceries. And if you think about the grocery market um, in developed world, um, you know, you have highly consolidated players like Tesco will own like 20% market share, Walmart will own 20% market share. Why hasn't that happened in Bangladesh? Why is there so many players, right? And the fact that there are so many players, there's actually a very expensive distribution system delivering to these so many, uh, so many players. There's a distributor, there's a manufacturer, etc. So what we, what we want to say is that you, know, you can't really build a Walmart in Bangladesh because real estate is really, really expensive and people you can't drive enough traffic to these um, stores. So if you can take the real estate out of the equation, you can probably start building a, uh, a business which actually can tap into the economy of scale, which will then automatically follow the path of, say, Walmart, right? So you take out the real estate, your real estate costs are like, say, one eighth of what it is for a, for a superstore, and you're suddenly uh, able to um, create unit economics positive uh, things. Like, the distribution network itself is very expensive, whereas if you are applying the technologies, right? Uh, like stocking algorithms, prediction algorithms, you can stock better, your damage will be less. Uh, all sorts of things like that will actually allow this business to grow really fast. So that's what I start by saying and then I say that when I'm in Bangladesh, I feel like a kid in a candy store. Every single opportunity is uh, very attractive because you can apply so much software. And we think that by being in grocery, we can easily network out into other parts of the business like sourcing of vegetables, uh, delivering trucks, etc. Like we'll be a platform for for everything. And if it works in a country like Bangladesh, where nothing has worked, it will probably work in countries like Nigeria or Thailand. Thank you very much uh, for the wonderful presentation. Can you uh, shed some light on the local retail uh, landscape? Why the uh, top players, uh, some of the top players, uh, were trying to establish their names in the retail segment are not uh, making money uh, at all. Uh, at least operating for five, ten years? I think, um, I mean, two things that are important um, in the grocery business is uh, the amount of damage, uh, like damage and pilferage, and other is the real estate cost. I really, really believe that the real estate is a challenge in, in Bangladesh, and just opening like stores with really high real estate costs, like you just can't drive enough traffic, right? So um, maybe they see it as a cost to, Maybe they see it as a, a cost to like basically you know, expand the business. Whereas their competition, right, doesn't have any real estate cost. Like Bonnie Valerie, maybe they're paying some sort of chanda or something. They don't have any labor cost. Uh, like they're sleeping on the, uh, in, in the stores, right? And it's not also that the top players, they don't also own the technology. They're uh, getting the technology from SAP uh, or, or some other company where they're paying like maybe uh, a few hundred thousand dollars a year for the technology. They cannot evolve the technology as well. So I think there's a lack of expertise in, how, in, in, in thinking about the supply chain, uh, which also plays um, uh, into the effect, right? So I think a mixture of these things, like I'm mostly, mostly real estate and probably lack of skill. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Rafiq Islam from Bacchetal Research. My question is about motivation. Like when you are thinking about starting a startup, you have pressure from your family, friends that if you love, if you leave your job from the next morning, you are just an unemployed person, or you might end up uh, losing your all of your savings. Then you have to start your career from the zero, from the beginning. So in that case, you will also face different challenges in the business. So it's I think it's really hard to keep oneself motivated. 
So how do you think that one entrepreneur should keep himself or the other partners motivated to keep working? Um, this is a this is a real, real real thing, right? For for me, it was a bit different because um, because I was earning a U.S. salary in a Singapore legal structure, but living in Bangladesh, so I saved a lot of money in the first five years. Um, so it was kind of easy, right? And then you know my parents didn't really have much to do, right? much to say because I went to Wharton, went to CFA, so you know I was, I've been right all my life, right? So it wasn't I didn't get much pressure from my uh, uh, parents. Or, or and I had a lot of money. Like okay, fine, I can live for ten years without doing anything. But but then I think what is also important is also to have the right founders. So not all of, not all three founders of uh, of the company have, have have the same background. So we understood that as a team, and we sort of made sure that everyone was in that um, comfort zone. Uh, so yeah. So I think it's a lot to do with the team, and also I think. The environment is changing as well, so you have to go to other people. If you meet other people who are doing this, one of the things that helped us is Y Combinator. So Y Combinator is this program which brings the best startups in the world, um, about 100 of them, uh, for a 10-week sort of crash course. So we just do dinners once a Tuesday, every Tuesday, uh, and it works out. So when we were before getting Y Combinator, our growth rate was maybe like five percent a month, and then I went to Y Combinator and I saw all the startups and this. Girl from Sweden was like, yeah, we grew 30% last week. And I looked at my uh, partner and I'm like, they grew 30% last week. We're doing like 5% a month. What are we doing? So it's it's important to have have that competition. And that was the fastest period of Charles' growth. Like we did uh, in two months, we did 200% growth. Um, uh, two, uh, 10 weeks, we did 200% growth. Uh, we were one of the largest companies now, but that would not have happened if we just stayed back at home. It was that competition that drove us. Like usually, like it, it, it's it's a spy. It's it's feedback loop is very bad. Like you just keep thinking the same thing. Yeah, where, where there's you should put that effort into thinking about the business. So when you became a founder, right? You put on a different hat. Um, you mentioned that each of you had a skill set, but to run a company successfully, there are many other things. Hiring. Marketing, uh, many other roles basically um, kind of co come into play. Um, so my question to you is that um, uh, how did you learn as an entrepreneur? Uh, how did you uh, fill the gaps in your knowledge uh, that you needed uh, to become where you are right now, basically? Uh, so the gaps in knowledge. Um, you read a lot. Do you read a lot? But you know, you know, the knowledge gaps themselves up, like you know, you face a problem and you think about the problem, a uh, solution usually comes, right? Um, uh, I mean, I still read a lot. I spend a lot of my time reading. Uh, I try to keep my schedule extremely um, open. Uh, so that's me. Um, whereas, uh, yeah, I mean, it's true for all three of us actually. In our fields, uh, we, we, we keep on like you know, learning about things uh, like you know, technology. They just really, like know all the latest things. Uh, but again, we have three different fields, and then the places where you have real gaps, you hire people, uh, and you just do. It. And if you find someone who can do it better than you, let them do it. So thank you. So we are uh, nearing the end of the session, and uh, so we can take one more questions, or okay, let's let's call it.